on the table for, our, for consideration. Um, and so we, we plan on being very aggressive on, on addressing it. Um, we already are seeing neighborhoods that don't have to have uh, heavy rains that they're having flooding, sunny day flooding. Um, it's real uh, and uh, we plan on taking it on uh, head on. Uh, until a few years ago, no one wanted to talk about this. And we did in Clearwater. We were just doing things that some of our residents didn't like. We were criticized because our sewage and our stormwater rates were higher than some of the other communities. But the reason they were is we were taking some of these steps that other communities are taking now. We've approved a green print plan years ago. We were the first city in Pinellas County to work with Duke Energy to change our lights, our street lights, to the LED lights. We were the first city to start talking about using water from the toilet to the tap. Yeah. So we think that we, because we are on the water much more so than, than most communities, but there are certain things that are beyond our control. We just try to make sure that our residents understand that they have a responsibility, just as much as government, to be good stewards of the environment. We had uh, Anne. Thank you, Anne McMullen with Royal Wealth Management. Thank you both, all three for being here. Um, I want to talk transportation, and I want to start with Mayor Buckhorn, but I want the others to answer. <laughs> Can we go out of order? Um, so, Mayor Buckhorn, you passed this transportation referendum over in Tampa. Um, as Mayor Predicos and Mayor Christum both said, your visitors, your tourists, want to come to St. Petersburg for the arts and have to go to the best beaches on the planet. Help us get everybody across. Um, how would you do that? What doors would you open? Who would you who would you introduce us to? And Mayor Christum, Mayor Predicos. What are you going to do for transportation? Um, great question, Ann. And I will tell you that I thought up until November that one of my biggest regrets leaving office that was that I was not able to make headway on the transportation issue. Now, that's partially because I don't control the method by which something is put on the ballot. That is largely the county commission. And over at Hillsborough, our county commission has been less than responsive to the needs of our community. And so we had a failed attempt in 2010. In 2016, they refused to even give the voters an opportunity to choose for themselves, which was really, really frustrating. Um, in 2018, a citizen-led petition um, got enough signatures to get it on the ballot. Um, and the volunteers associated with that really worked this hard. And I think I can say with certainty, because we voted for both transportation and for a half cent for schools, which put us as the highest sales tax in the state of Florida. But clearly that was a decision that the voters were willing to live with and a price that they were willing to pay, largely I think because the pain threshold in my county had been reached. It was affecting our quality of life. It was affecting our ability to attract companies here. Um, it was affecting everything that we did and everybody knew that it was a problem. They didn't want to wait for the politicians anymore. So they stepped up and they put it on the ballot and it won, in both cases, overwhelmingly. And so my only recommendation to you is that it not be top down, that it be grassroots up, that it be the business community and civic activists that rise up and say, look, elected officials, step out of the way. We're gonna need you for the implementation, but we don't need you right now. We need my neighbors to understand that this is not a UN plot. <laughs> That there's nothing about transit that is involved with Agenda 2030. <laughs> that it is desperately needed. And if we don't do something about transportation, we will kill the goose that laid the golden egg. And my kids and your grandkids uh, will have a severely negatively impact uh, on their quality of life. So it's an investment in your future. So, yeah, thank you. And I think we've got to learn a lot from what Hillsborough did the way they did it and try and, and look at how we did it here in Pinellas and the mistakes we made uh, and uh, incorporate 
the good things that they did and get rid of the bad things that we did. Uh, we've got to have a dedicated funding stream. But short of that, and, and that's a ways off, uh, it's incumbent on all of us in Pinellas County uh, that are in leadership to look for opportunities to, to move transit forward, uh, whether it's our, uh, us funding it ourselves or it's public-private partnerships. I mean, I think the ferry is a great example of where four government entities got together uh, and said we've got to do something to try and connect um, our two largest cities of, of Tampa and St. Petersburg. Uh, and, and it's been remarkably successful. If you haven't ridden it yet, get on the ferry. It's, it's a blast. Um, but I think it's more than that. We've got to look at all the different options that we have available to us. Uh, you know, the, the DOT's been talking about the premium transit service from Wesley Chapel that ultimately would go to downtown St. Petersburg. That is incredibly important. And while I'd love to have light rail, and I know a lot of other folks would, right now the federal government, the state government aren't funding it. So we've got to take that step and give ourselves the flexibility. And that gets you from Wesley Chapel to USF Tampa to downtown Tampa to West Shore to Carolina to downtown St. Petersburg. Then we've got to connect to the beaches and all over the county. Uh, that's critically important, especially if we're going to have Virgin Trains coming from Orlando to downtown Tampa. Those folks are going to want to come to the beaches of Clearwater or the, or the museums in downtown St. Petersburg. We need to be able to connect from downtown Tampa to downtown St. Petersburg to downtown Clearwater and the Clearwater beaches, and whether, as I mentioned before, it's uh, you know it's BRT or it's elevated aerial transit, I don't care what it is, but we've got to take those steps forward. It's good to know that some of our county commissioners are here, and hopefully they're hearing what we're saying. But what Mayor Buckhorn and Mayor Christman have said is correct, and I, I know. You know, Commissioner Welch and Commissioner Justice would agree that we can't do this by ourselves. We need you to help us out. You know, we need you to make sure that people understand that government, local government, needs help to provide this type of infrastructure improvement. And then we need to support them and let them know that we're behind them. Tampa failed the first time. The business community and the residents came together the second time to get it done. <coughs> and that's what we're going to have to do to make sure that our elected officials know that that's what we want. Because I would love, you know, when I was working in Washington, in two years I put 3,000 miles on my car. And it wasn't because I lived a block from the Capitol and drove my car every day. It's because I use public transportation five days a week. It was a whole lot more convenient. And we can do that here. Ms. James. <laughs> so the year is 2030. The year is 2030. Is this? Oh, sorry, Joni James. The year is 2030. Tampa Bay is on the rise. We're this really dynamic region. Do we have a baseball team? And if so, where are they playing? <laughs> the, the Philadelphia Phillies will still pass. <laughs> Jays will be in the new. Yes, we're going to have baseball. How be damned if I know? You know, uh, I would hope so. I think the market could support it. I think Major League Baseball wants to be here. Uh, I think they certainly want to be in Florida, and I think they want to be in the Tampa Bay region. Um, it is a profitable region for them. Uh, the TV contract, I think, we will find at some point to be a very, very lucrative one. Um, the question becomes where and who pays for it. Um, clearly, I just went through this dance. Um, it wasn't the most pleasant thing I've ever been through. and. Um, it was no secret that there is no public appetite to pay for these stadiums. So you have to be really creative in terms of how you do it, and you, it, it's a process that doesn't lend itself to a quick solution. 
particularly when you can't even get the other side to agree that it's a 50-50 deal. Um, that was part of the challenge. The other part of the challenge, Tony, is the vehicles and the instruments by which we would have had to build this stadium uh, required a lot of creativity, required a number of third parties to participate. Um, there was a lot of hair on this deal. It was a complicated transaction. And my sense was that the Rays ownership wasn't interested in something that, that had that many moving parts. Um, I said from day one, five, six years ago, eight years ago, that I was willing to do my very best to keep the Rays in the region because I think they are a regional asset. And if it's not in Tampa, I'm going to be very supportive of what Mayor Kreisman will embark on soon. Um, but I wasn't willing to do a bad deal. And I wasn't willing to burden future generations of Tampanians with debt they couldn't pay. Um, and so I think we got to that point on our side of the bay. I'm not sure it's entirely dead, uh, but it certainly is in need of resuscitation uh, on our side. Um, so I think the ball literally and figuratively is now in Mayor Christman's court, and he's got a wonderful opportunity with 80 prime acres to do something magical. Hit clean up here. Um, <laughs> I, I certainly think, in answer to your question, I certainly think it's it's possible that they will be here in 2030. Um, I have said from the beginning when we first started talking to the Rays and uh, and they wanted to look that I felt that the Tropicana Field site still made it made the best sense. I said it back then. I still say it today. I still think of all the locations, it makes the most sense. Uh, I never did see locations. In, in, uh, in Hillsborough and Tampa that I thought would work quite as well. And I think the Ebor site proved just that, as Bob was saying, there was huge challenges that they faced aside from just the cost of the stadium, and just in, uh, assembling the land, getting the land ready for redevelopment, who's gonna pay the taxes, all of those challenges that quite frankly we don't have. And so, you know, I look forward to, to the conversations with the Rays to find out what their intentions are, if, if their intentions are to do a new stadium. Uh, then let's get to work on it, and let's be partners, and let's figure out how to make it happen, uh, but happen in a way that's good for our residents, uh, and obviously if they're a partner, then good for the Rays. Um, but quite frankly, I've also said this, if you know, we want the Rays here, but if they were to leave, for whatever reason, at their end of their use agreement, the city of St. Petersburg will be just fine. We have 86 acres that we're, we will be redeveloping, uh, and it gives us a huge opportunity, an opportunity that a lot of cities around the country don't have as far as the, the impact that a, a site can have and the, the jobs it can create and the housing it can address uh, that the Tropicana Field site has. And that's incredibly exciting uh, to my team and our city council and I think a whole lot of folks in the city of St. Petersburg. So uh, we'll see what happens. Notice I'm accepting no men's questions. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Joanne Lentino. I'm a member of the uh, Pinellas County School Board. And I want to bring it down to uh, a little more uh, classroom-oriented um, positions that our school teachers have and that are facing. Bob Baltieri, um, in a recent article several weeks ago, had stated that all teachers should have guns in the classroom. And now my question to you is, do you think that any teacher should have a gun in a classroom? The short answer is no. And I say that as somebody who has guns, um, quite a few, um, who likes having guns, who shoots quite frequently. Um, and I have no problem with the Second Amendment in the hands of responsible gun owners. The idea that we should arm teachers is ridiculous. Um, that's not what teachers do. That's not what they signed up for. That's not what they're trained for. You don't want to put a weapon in the hands of somebody who is not accustomed to using it, um, who is unprepared, in spite of whatever minimal training that they will get. Um, that's not the environment that we want for our kids, nor do I think uh, the vast majority of teachers want. Now, obviously, we have challenges with hardening the targets of our, our schools. We got issues of mental health and identifying those people who should not have guns. Um, we've got a Florida legislature and a governor that doesn't seem to be inclined to want to deal with issues of gun violence. I can tell you as mayors who have to clean up the aftermath of gun violence, 
Um, we stand ready to do something about it. And the fact that we are preempted, preempted, understand this, if any of the mayors up here do anything related to reducing gun violence or passing any legislation that affects gun ownership, we can be held personally liable and removed from office. That's the control the NRA has over the Florida legislature. That is insane. Responsible gun owners are responsible gun owners. Concealed carry permit owners who carry responsibly, got no problem. We don't need teachers being armed. There's got to be a better solution. I've already lost 30 of my cops for the last six months in the schools in Hillsborough County, in elementary schools. Um, there's got to be a better solution, but it starts with a common sense discussion about the impact of gun violence and the appropriate steps that don't infringe on the Second Amendment. So you heard Bob say he's a gun owner, which is part of the reason George and I talk so nice about him. <laughs> um, no, I, the policy, the suggestion of arming teachers is, in my mind, insanity. I'm sure those of you who know me aren't shocked to hear me say that. Um, you know, talking to our police officers, you know, one of their biggest fears is when they're going into a, a, a scene where there's an active shooter, they're going to be looking for anyone who has a gun. They're not going to.